This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We end today's show with journalist Peter Moss, who has written an opinion piece for The Washington Post headlined, I'm Jewish and I've covered wars. I know war crimes when I see them, unquote. Until recently, Peter was a senior editor at The Intercept. He's the author of Love Thy Neighbor, A Story of War. He covered the Bosnia War for The Washington Post and the U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq for The New York Times Magazine. Peter, welcome to Democracy Now! You begin your piece in The Washington Post by saying, how does it feel to be a war crimes reporter whose family bankrolled a nation that's committing war crimes? I can tell you. Lay it out for us. Well, my great-great-grandfather was Jacob Schiff, who is a financier at the end of the 19th century and early 20th century, uh, one of the wealthiest people in the country, probably, um, who donated a lot of money and organized um, the, the movement of Jews, persecuted Jews from Europe, largely from Russia, but also from other countries in Russia, to any safe haven that would have them, including America, but also significantly British-controlled Palestine. And then his son-in-law, my great-grandfather, Felix Warburg, who married Jacob Schiff's daughter, continued that process of supporting and helping to organize the migration of persecuted, Jew persecuted Jews from Europe to British-controlled Palestine. This is before World War II, the Holocaust, and the establishment of Israel. Yet you say they were anti-Zionists. Can you explain? Well, they were non-Zionists, which was actually different, um, significantly different uh, from being anti-Zionist. There was a movement amongst uh, American Jews and Jews elsewhere in Europe that was called non-Zionism. And for them, the non-Zionists, the point was Jews should be able to go to British-controlled Palestine. They need to go to British-controlled Palestine because they need refuge from the persecution they're suffering in Europe. But they were against the establishment of a Jewish state for two reasons. One is that they were concerned that if there were a Jewish state, then all the anti-Semites in America and elsewhere would look at Jews who are not living in this Jewish state and say, ah, you know, your loyalty is actually this other country. And that would kind of increase suspicions of, of Jews and, and make them seem lesser citizens in the countries that they were living in. And then the second concern, which is one that a lot of people had, but that non-Zionists um, also had and, and, and pronounced, was they were concerned about violence between Arabs and Jews. They just kind of said, look, you know, if one side, the Jews or the Arabs for that matter, uh, try to exert total control over the state that's going to be established there, because remember at this time, Palestine was under the uh, control of British mandate, uh, then it's going to be really violent. Uh, my great-grandfather referred to it as a shooting gallery. And, and Peter, you also covered the wars in Croatia and Bosnia. And could you talk about how your uh, your journalism there helped uh, helps inform your perspective of what's going on? Because many of, of course, of our listeners and viewers are not familiar with uh, those uh, those wars and the war crimes committed there. In the early 1990s, uh, Yugoslavia, which was a kind of conglomeration of, of uh, different republics, uh, five or six, I forget the precise number, actually, um, began to fall apart. And instead of falling apart peacefully, it fell apart uh, violently. And there was first a war when Slovenia, one of the republics, uh, uh, seceded. And then there was an even larger war when Croatia, another one of its constituent republics, uh, uh, seceded. And then when Bosnia did the same, this was uh, in 1992, this was unfortunately the largest war of all. There were a significant number of Serbs who lived in Bosnia. Um, and Slobodan Milosevic, who was the leader in Belgrade of kind of all Serbs in the country, organized the um, kind of provisioning of, of military material and uh, uh, soldiers, guerrilla fighters, paramilitaries, uh, to go in and uh, basically fight against the Muslims and Croats in Bosnia who wanted to have an independent state and who voted in a referendum for an independent state. And the warfare, which I went to cover, it was not your ordinary war of army against army. It was a, a war of paramilitaries committing atrocities against defenseless uh, civilians, largely Muslims, some Croats. 
And it also consisted of sieges against the few cities that were able to resist the onslaught. Sarajevo was one of these cities. Srebrenica was another one of these cities. And so I was there covering this war, seeing terrible things happen that are not supposed to happen in war. I mean, wars are violent. Civilians get killed in, in wars. But it's not always illegal. In this case, there were civilians right under my window in Sarajevo, getting shot by snipers. I wrote about that. There were civilians whose houses were getting bombed. There were civilians who were standing in bread lines who were getting bombed and killed. There were aid shipments of medicine and food that were being prohibited from entry into these so-called safe areas because they were supposed to have been protected by the United Nations, but were not. And so I was there reporting on this. And in 1993, a year after this war began, uh, there was an international cr criminal tribunal that was set up to investigate war crimes and possible genocide that was occurring at the time in Bosnia. And that tribunal subsequently did um, hold a number of trials, including a senior Bosnian Serb leaders, the military leader Ratko Mladic, the political leader Radovan Karadzic, and the Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic, in which the charges included genocide. And both Karadzic and Mladic are now in jail for the rest of their lives on charges that include genocide. So I was reporting on this genocide. As you compare what you saw in Bosnia to what you saw in Gaza, you write in that piece, when I reported from besieged Sarajevo, I stayed in a hotel that was smack on the front line with Serbian snipers routinely firing at civilians walking under my window. On a spring day in 1993, I heard the familiar crack and whistle of a sniper's bullet followed by an awful scream. I went to my window and saw a wounded civilian trying to crawl to safety. Um, writing in the Post more than three decades ago, I described the man's desperate shouts as a mad howl of a person pushed over the edge. It came from the lungs, from the heart, from the mind, you write in The Washington Post. You also write, about disturbing video footage from Gaza that shows Khala Khres walking on a so-called safe route in January with her grandson, five-year-old Taim Adel, who was holding a white flag when she was shot and killed by an Israeli sniper. Talk about uh, the comparisons or what you call the rhymes. Yeah, I mean, God, I remember those stories so well. Um, this is the most. There's so many disturbing things going on in in in, in Gaza now and in, in the West Bank, but um, as the Israeli attack uh, began after the Hamas attack on October 7th against Israel, um, you know, we began seeing these videos and reports emerging from these very brave journalists in Gaza um, of what was happening. And, for example, that video of this grandmother being shot, obviously quite intentionally. And everything that I was seeing, flower line massacres in, in, in Gaza, for example, um, airdrops of humanitarian aid that killed some of the people they were intended to uh, help because they landed on top of these people, also happened in, in Bosnia. Um, I began seeing just the same kinds of incidents that were the constituent elements in Bosnia of, of genocide um, also happening in Gaza, but kind of most disturbing in a way, uh, at a scale that was larger than Bosnia. I mean, for example, you know, in Bosnia, over the course of its four-year war, there were something like seven or 8,000 children killed, which is terrible. Um, in Gaza, over the course of, of just six months, there have been more than 13,000 children killed. So, you know, I just could not help but see not only the parallels, but also how what seems to be unfolding in, in Gaza is even worse than what I saw in, in Bosnia. And we, we have less than a minute left, but I'm wondering your perspective on how the U.S. media has been covering the war in Gaza. It's been a real mixed bag. And it was a real mixed bag in Bosnia. Um, you know, in, and, and we're all kind of captives of our experiences. And so I covered the war in Bosnia. I also covered other wars. So, you know, I may be talking too much about Bosnia, but I think it is relevant. Um, in Bosnia, there was exceptionally good coverage, I think, and I'm biased on this, but I think um, from the journalists who were on the ground, largely foreign journalists, but also uh, a, lot of, a lot of Bosnian journalists, really good coverage of actually what was going on. But then in the, in the foreign capitals, in Washington, D.C., but also London and France, uh, France and, and, and um, uh, 
and Britain were very important elements of the international community at the time. Uh, the reporting was terrible because it reflected the, the, the kind of briefings that the journalists were getting from, from all their government sources and all the think tank people, and, and they were just saying, oh, it's a we mess. We have 15 that seconds, to kill Peter. Each other. So we have the same problem now where there's a lot of bad coverage coming out of the capitals, such as Washington, although from the ground itself, the reporting's quite excellent. We want to thank you so much for being with us. Peter Moss, journalist, former senior editor for The Intercept, author of Love Thy Neighbor, A Story of War. We'll link to your latest piece in The Washington Post. He also covered U.S. invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq for The New York Times. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.